So let's switch gears and talk about something else now. Let's talk about what PIP is. Uh, PIP is your peak inspiratory pressure. And what does that mean? Well, peak inspiratory pressure. As you're taking a breath in, the peak pressure, the highest pressure in your large airways as you're taking a breath in. That is what PIP is, the peak inspiratory pressure. So that number is gonna be a readout, a digital readout that's gonna be on your display with every single breath. It's gonna tell you what the pressures are in the airway every single time the patient takes a breath. So you need to look at that number and trend that number and keep an eye on it because it's a very, very important number. Before we start talking about PIP, let's talk about, um, it's on the same lines as PIP, but let's talk about using a BVM and ventilating because we hear a lot of objections when we talk about people with a BVM. They want to use a BVM. It's something they know they're comfortable with, especially in a traumatic situation. If you have a trauma and, for example, maybe it's a motor vehicle accident with a T-bone injury uh, where the patient was the driver of the vehicle, the vehicle got T-boned on the driver's side, the patient's complaining of left-sided chest pain, there's some bruising there. And as you're, dri as you're driving down the road and you're transporting the patient or in the air, uh, the patient goes unconscious. We intubate the patient uh, to protect their airway, we're ventilating them, and as we're doing so, we start to feel that bag. And as we're squeezing that bag, I can feel the compliance and it's getting worse and worse and worse. It's getting harder to ventilate this patient. So I immediately know, I say, okay, well, I know that there was a T-bone accident. It's on the driver's side. I'm suspecting, a high index of suspicion tells me that they might have some injury on the left side of their chest. It's getting harder to bag that patient, possibly a pneumothorax. So I would listen to lung sounds, confirm, and maybe do a chest decompression. But if I'm not using a, a BVM, I'm, I'm using a ventilator and I'm not using a BVM, I'm never going to be able to feel that compliance. So why would I want to use a ventilator over a BVM? Because that BVM is going to tell me the compliance and I lose a very key piece of information by not knowing that compliance, by not feeling that change. Well, a couple things. First of all, when you're feeling for compliance, when you're feeling that on a, on a BVM, you're ventilating your patient every three to five seconds. You're not going to notice a slight change in compliance for a very, very long time. And studies have shown that you don't notice a change in compliance until point the patient where it's too late, where the patient is in cardiac arrest or very near cardiac arrest. So when you find a change in compliance, it's usually the oh crap moment where you have to react. And, and if you don't do it quickly, and if you don't catch it quickly, it's probably gonna be the demise of your patient. So feeling for compliance, although it sounds cool and it sounds like something we've been taught, it's usually not something that we catch rapidly enough to make very much of a difference. The nice thing about using a ventilator is you get a digital readout of what your PIP is. Well, guess what? PIP is a numerical value that measures the compliance in your lungs. It's the pressure in the large airways. So as somebody's developing a pneumothorax, that PIP number is going to climb and get higher and higher and higher, meaning it's getting harder to ventilate or squeeze that bag. So instead of recognizing it 30 or 40 breaths later, I can trend it and keep an eye on it and I can see it with every single breath. So it's really important to look at your PIP number. It's always very important to trend it because that tells you a lot about what's happening with your patient. If you understand how PIP works, it truly is a window into the future. It will tell you what is going on with your patient, what is happening with your patient. So let's start talking about modes of ventilation on your device because your devices are going to come with several different modes of ventilation. But before we do, what differentiates different modes of ventilation are how the device is going to react when it recognizes the patient taking a breath. When a patient takes a breath, the machine has to recognize that. So your machine recognizes that. When the diaphragm starts to pull down, it creates a negative pressure or a suction. When that negative pressure or suction is recognized by the machine, it triggers a breath. So it defaults to a setting of negative two centimeters of suction or negative two centimeters of pressure. So if the patient pulls greater than negative two centimeters of suction, it says, oh, the patient must be breathing and it will act appropriately. So that's how it recognizes the breath. So let's start talking about the modes of ventilation that you have inside your machine. So your device comes with 
Uh, I believe you guys purchased the Z-Vent Advanced. It comes with assist control, volume and pressure. It comes with SIMV, volume and pressure. It gives you the option to do CPAP and bi-level uh, ventilations. So those are the modes of ventilation that come with your device. We're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about each of those and differentiating what is different between the two different, uh, between all the different modes. First of all, we're gonna talk about assist control. Assist control has both a volume mode and a pressure mode. If I take the word assist control and I break it down into the two words, assist and control, that's exactly what your machine does. It's going to assist your patient with a controlled volume of 500. Every single time it ventilates your patient, it will assist them with a controlled volume of 500 cc's. You set an assist control volume, the tidal volume. If you're in volume mode, you set the volume. Uh, I'll give you a hint, when you're in pressure mode, you set the pressure, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. So in other words, if I'm in assist control volume, I set the tidal volume, I dial it into the device, and let's say I make it 500. Every single breath that goes in is gonna be set at 500 because I've programmed the device to give a volume of 500. So you also, in assist control volume, set a backup rate. And what that backup rate does is if the patient's not breathing or if they fall below a certain rate, it's going to kick in and ventilate your patient. If your patient is not breathing at all, if they're not ventilating themselves at all, the machine is going to, if you set it to 12 breaths a minute, every five seconds, ventilate your patient. So that's how it works when the patient is not breathing. Well, how does it work when the patient takes their own breath? Well, if it recognizes the patient takes their own breath, and like I said, it's gonna recognize that when the patient inhales, and the diaphragm sucks down, creates a negative pressure. If it exceeds negative two centimeters of water or pressure, it recognizes that as a breath and it will react appropriately. So what does react appropriately when we were talking about assist control volume? Well, again, it's going to assist them with a controlled volume of 500 cc. So it doesn't matter who initiates the breath. If the patient initiates the breath, they get 500 cc's, no more, no less. If the machine initiates the breath, they get 500 cc's, no more, no less. So that's how assist control volume works. If the patient did not take a breath, the machine will ventilate them. If they took a breath, it's gonna ventilate them at 500 cc's. It starts the timer over again. So that's how it works. Uh, very simple. It's basically used as a smart BVM. That's really what it does. And I'll talk about why I mean a smart BVM in just a moment. But let's talk about pressure mode. What is different between volume and pressure? Well, in the volume mode, I told you I set the volume, right? I set the volume to 500. Well, what about in pressure mode? When I set the pressure mode, I set the pressure, I told you. What do I mean by that? Well, the pressure that I'm setting is the PIP, the peak inspiratory pressure. So to understand that concept, I'm gonna give you two examples. First, if I have a balloon, Right? If I'm blowing up a balloon, I put it to my mouth and I'm blowing this balloon up, the balloon expands. The closer and closer I get to end inflation, the most air that I can put into this balloon, it gets harder and harder for me to blow it up. Why? Because all that air that's inside the balloon is now exerting a pressure back onto me and I have to exceed that pressure. Well, your device is measuring that pressure. So it measures that amount of pressure. And the theory if I is, blow that balloon up to a certain amount of pressure, it's gonna give me a certain amount of tidal volume or a certain amount of stretch or expansion on my lungs. That amount of stretch or expansion is always gonna give me a consistent tidal volume is what the theory is. So if I stretch it out to a PIP of 25, I know the lung is gonna stretch out to here. So that is how we do it. It's the same exact thing as doing tidal volume because what you would do in this mode of ventilation is you would titrate your PIP, the amount of stretch, to give you the tidal volume you desire. It kind of sounds like, well, if they're both ways of getting the tidal volume that I desire, why would I not just tell the machine what the tidal volume is that I want? And we'll talk about that in just a second. But I told you I'd give you another example because sometimes that one doesn't stick too well to people. But maybe this one will. Let's talk about a tire on your vehicle, on your car, or a bike. We know that it takes a certain amount of volume of air to inflate that tire. I can say 
your tire needs, I'm just going to pick a number, 5,000 cc's of air to inflate it fully. So I can program my machine to 5,000 cc's of air and as it gets to 5,000 and 5,000 are delivered, I'm assured my tire is full. But that's not how we do our tires now, right? When we check our tires, we check a pressure. We use a pressure gauge. We know that if I get to 35 PSI on my pressure gauge, that equates to the volume of 500. So you can see how a pressure always equates to a certain volume by thinking of a tire pressure gauge. And that's the same thing when it comes to a ventilator. I need to get a certain tidal volume to my patient. I can either directly dial in the volume or I can put a, if you want, call it a PSI. It's not a PSI, it's a uh, centimeters of water pressure, but whatever that pressure is that I dial in is gonna give me that same exact tidal volume, just like with the tire example that we used. So I posed the question a, a couple minutes ago. I said, well, it just sounds like a roundabout way of getting tidal volume. Why, why not just put the volume? Why even have a pressure mode of ventilation? It sounds like it would be just a lot easier to just say, I want 500 cc's of tidal volume. Why not just go to assist control volume and put in 500? Why do I have to go titrate the pressures and get 500 if I know that's the volume I want? Well, there's a reason for that. With the volume mode of ventilation, if you're in assist control volume, if you dial 500 cc's of tidal volume, the machine is gonna do everything it can to make sure that 500 cc's of volume gets into your patient. The problem is on most patients, it's gonna be just fine, but when you have somebody with a pneumothorax that's developing, what is gonna to happen to your patient? It's gonna give 500 cc's and it's gonna collapse. It's gonna give 500 cc's and collapse every breath, 500 cc's. The problem comes up when that pneumo gets worse and worse and worse and the pressures get worse. Remember the pressures, the PIP is the compliance. So it's getting harder to squeeze. So there's a little tiny hole inside that lung, right? I'm putting more pressure and exerting more pressure in that airway. What's gonna to happen to that little hole? It's gonna expand, right? It's gonna make that pneumo worse. So the problem with the volume mode, although we have alarms and everything on the machine, the problem with volume mode is, is the machine doesn't care what the pressure is. It doesn't care what your PIP is. It doesn't care what's going on with the compliance. It's going to just push harder to get that 500 cc's in. Okay. So you can see how that can be dangerous to a trauma patient or to somebody who might develop a pneumothorax or a change of compliance. It could also happen with somebody who's bronchospasming, uh, somebody who's COPD or asthma. If their airway gets constricted a little bit more, but it gets tighter, it's harder for them to breathe, the machine's just going to force more air in there and it could cause some trauma to the lungs. So a lung protective strategy would be to go to a pressure mode because the nice thing about the pressure mode is is if I know that, let's say, 25 of PIP is going to give me that 500 cc's of tidal volume, I know that if they develop a pneumo, once it reaches that 25 of PIP, it's going to cut off and it's never going to add more pressure. So it protects the lung and it will not make that pneumo worse. But there's a downfall there too. Because you're in assist controlled pressure, it has no control over the volume, right? it's going to inflate until that pressure gets there. So think about what happens with the pneumothorax. If you inflate the lung and it gets to a PIP of 25, it inflates the lung to here. And I'm happy with that. But as that pneumo develops, right, that PIP of 25, that pressure, because the compliance is getting worse, instead of expanding to here, it expands to here. And then as that pneumo gets worse, when it expands, instead of going to here, it expands to here and then to here, and then to here, until we slowly suffocate our patient to death and they die. So that's the problem with assist control pressure. It keeps an eye on that pressure, it protects the lung, but you have no control over the tidal volume because the tidal volume is dependent on what the compliance is on that lung, the peak pressure. So they both have a downfall. So assist control volume has a downfall, assist control pressure has a downfall. How do we make sure that that doesn't create a problem for us? Well, it's very simple. When you're in assist control volume, you're not in control of the pressure. When you're in assist control pressure, you're not in control of the volume. Well, that's simple. Anything that we're not in control over, we should always document and trend. So I'm in assist control volume, I would always document and trend 
the thing that I'm not in control over, the PIP. If I see that PIP number starting to climb, I know there's a problem. If I'm in assist control pressure, I'm not in control of the tidal volume. If I see the tidal volume start to drop, I know there's a problem, right? So I would trend what I'm not in control over. It's really that simple. By trending those numbers, I will now have an idea of what's happening with my patient, and I know what I can do to correct it. You know, I'll have an idea of what's happening physiologically with my patient to where there's no surprises. So that's what you should do. If you're in assist control volume, you should trend your PIP. If you're in assist control pressure, you should trend your tidal volume. Which mode is better? Well, that's up to your doc.